Whenever we review a new family car at Auto Express, we focus on the sensible stuff. Is it roomy? Is it practical? Is it good value for money? Now I won't lie, some of the cars which nail all three of those things tend to be just a little bit dull, but the fact is they make sense if it's your own money you're spending. On the other hand, there are cars which I drive where I think, I'm really quite fond of this, but when you do the maths, they just don't stack up. Anyway, this is the new Mazda MX-30, and you know what? I'm really quite fond of it. Before we take a look at the MX-30 in detail, make sure you subscribe to the Auto Express channel for the latest news, reviews, and track battles. Onto the MX-30 then, and as it turns out, an EV has been a long time coming for Mazda. It's experimented with electric powertrains for over 50 years. Its first electric concept, the EX005 microcar, dates back to 1970. While it has since made zero emission show cases of the two Super Mini and even the first gen MX-5. The new car may share the MX moniker with the world's most popular roadster, but the MX-30 is an altogether chunkier thing. It's a compact crossover that will sit in an area of the market that includes the Kia Soul EV and the DS3 Crossback E-Tent. But Mazda wants this to be seen as a stylish take on the electric formula, so you can throw in similarly priced cars like the Mini Electric and the Honda E too. So let's talk about the styling then. The MX-30 borrows elements of the CX-30's design, like the chunky wheel arch cladding, but overall it's sleeker and lower, in part to improve the aerodynamic efficiency. There's a very long bonnet, which is quite unusual for an EV, and we'll come back to that later. And then there's the colour. Sol Red is just brilliant, isn't it? Now, just like the outside of the MX-30, I really like the way it looks on the inside. Take this steering wheel, for example. It's just one of the nicest to look at and to hold of any affordable car you can care to think of, really. And Mazda are really keen to push the eco credentials of this car, too. This material up here is made out of recycled bottles, while there's cork trim around the bottom and in this storage pocket here, which is perfect if you forget something to say and maybe you can pin a note to it like a bulletin board. Then we've got this touch screen here. Now this is exclusively for the heater controls. Now normally I'm not too happy about having the heater controls on a touch screen, but there's a couple of exceptions for this one. For a start, there are still physical buttons for the fan speed and heater, which makes you wonder why there's a touch screen at all, to be honest. But secondly, even the buttons on the screen are very large. What's really weird though, is that the infotainment system itself isn't touch screen at all. You can only control it through this click wheel. But otherwise, it's a really good system. The graphics are great, the menus are well laid out, and the loading times are quick enough. So if you're up front, you'll be purring at all those lovely details. And this top spec model comes with the Bose sound system too, which is great because you'll be able to turn it up loud enough to drown out the sound of the passengers in the back, who will probably start grumbling even before they've got in. And that's because of the doors. Now, some of you might remember the Mazda RX-8, which had this funny rear hinged back door arrangement. Now this has got the same thing. So the front door opens normally, but this one, like that. And I always found it a little bit weird on the RX-8 that I had a door system like that, but the fact is it was quite a stylish coupe essentially. So the impracticalities of it didn't really matter. But they do here because this is a family crossover. It's got to be easy to use every day. And that gap there is just tiny to get in and out of the back. What I can't understand is why they didn't just put a normal rear door on it. I mean, it's got space. Speaking of space, let's take a look at the back. And I'm afraid there really isn't that much space in the back of here. Now I'm only five foot seven and this driver's seat is set for my position. And as you can see, there's not really that much knee room. Headroom is okay, but not amazing. And my feet are kind of wedged under the seat in front. Also, this squab is quite low and shallow, which means my legs are up at an angle. So on a longer journey, you'd probably get quite tired in the back of here as well. And because of this door design, there's not as much glass as you'd get in a normal car. So it feels quite claustrophobic. Overall, a Kia Soul EV and a Volkswagen ID3 both feel far more spacious. Unlike the ID3, which was purpose built as an EV from the outset, the MX-30 rides on a platform adapted from the one used by the Mazda 3 and the CX-30. The benefits from VW's methods are that without an engine to worry about, it can make the bonnet shorter and move the bulkhead forward, giving much more space for people inside. The MX-30, however, still has that huge bonnet, but instead of anything at all, there's just a big empty space under there. Now, a big part of that is because the MX-30 might be available as a plug-in hybrid at a later date, giving enough room in there to slot just a little combustion engine. But for now, it's electric only. 
And as EVs go, the MX-30 carries on Mazda's great form for building driver's cars. Whenever I get into a new Mazda, it only takes a couple hundred yards to realize what a well-sorted car it is to drive. Regardless of whether you're in the Mazda 3 or the MX-5 or a CX-5, the weighting of all the controls feels spot on. The steering response is lovely, the brake feels really solid and reassuring, and the clutch and the gearbox are so well matched to each other. And it's the same for this. Well, except for the gearbox, obviously. As EVs go, I'd say the MX-30 is the best to drive of any of the affordable ones by a mile. You could say that the Mini is a little bit sharper to drive, but it's nowhere near as comfortable as this. And while the ID4 is really good at suppressing noise from any bumps that you hit, this isn't far off and it's so much more fun. What I will say is it isn't the fastest of EVs. It's got 143 horsepower driving the front wheels and if you put your foot down, yeah, it goes, but it's not with the same sort of enthusiasm you get from a Mini or a Honda E even and especially the Kia Soul EV. The MX-30 suspension layout is fairly conventional, with a McPherson strut setup up front and a torsion beam at the back. But Mazda employs some clever tech to keep things sharp. Its eGVC Plus system uses both the brakes and the electric motor to balance out the car, both on corner entry and exit, to give it a smoother drive. Now the MX-30's 0 to 60 time is just under 10 seconds, but really it does feel quicker than that in the real world, because like most EVs, it's got a really quick initial step off, so it does feel very nippy around town. On a motorway, it does feel a little bit more lethargic, but it can still sit at 70 very happily. Now if you just look behind the steering wheel here, you can see a couple of paddles. Now unlike on a combustion engine car where they'd be controlling the gears, in this they actually adjust the rate of brake regeneration. So if you click it two up from its standard place, it completely coasts without any regeneration at all. If you click it in the other direction, there's two levels which give a much stronger rate of regeneration. Now it's not quite the full one pedal driving that you get from say a Nissan Leaf, but it does slow down enough so that you would very rarely need to actually touch the brake pedal unless you're braking hard. Now like most EVs, if you ever find yourself driving around town, then the MX-30 is such a doddle. Really smooth, really quiet, all the controls feel very easy and it's just such a simple thing to manoeuvre about. That electric motor is just perfectly suited to town driving. The one thing that I will say about the MX-30 though is that over the shoulder visibility isn't great. There's a really big C pillar there so if you're pulling out of funny junctions you're just constantly looking around and you don't quite know what's going on. Officially, the MX-30's 35.5 kilowatt hour battery means it can just cover 124 miles on a single charge, but in the real world, it can drop even lower than that. And while Mazda will rightly argue that the average daily journey is significantly shorter than that figure, it's a number that means the MX-30 is only really good as a second car. The 50 kilowatt CCS connection means that a 20 to 80% charge, or 74 miles of extra range, should take about 36 minutes. The Kia Soul EV can accept 100 kilowatt charging, while a top spec ID3 accepts 125 kilowatts, meaning that it can add much more range in the same amount of time. And while the prices look fairly reasonable on paper, with a battery so small compared to its rivals, it's hard to see where that money is gone. Including the UK's government plug-in car grant, prices start from about £26,000 and top out at a little over 30. And yes, the Mazda is well equipped, with standard LED headlights, a reversing camera and adaptive cruise control. But the base Volkswagen ID3 will offer similar performance at a similar price, yet it's far more spacious inside and should return almost double the range on a single charge. So then, how do I sum up the Mazda MX-30? Well, I love the way that it looks both inside and out, and it's brilliant to drive. However, there are just too many flaws for it to make sense as a family car. It's really cramped in the back. It's not brilliant value for money and that range is just not gonna cut it for some people. If you're using your head, there are definitely better options out there. But what do you think? Would you choose the Mazda MX-30 or is there another of its all electric rivals that you prefer? Let us know in the comments below and thanks for watching.